Mahalele, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join your courageous conversation this morning. Um, it is an, uh, a privilege uh, to be able to speak with you on some of the work that we're doing here, and hopefully it will help you. But uh, as we know with all things here, uh, we learn to listen carefully, and then we only take what we think we need um, in our journeys, in our individual journeys. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Nick to please uh, share my screen because I will just talk to my pictures um, this morning and hopefully at the end of it, we'll bring something concrete uh, to the table. Um, hopefully my presentation will shed some light uh, on how we work here at the Institute of Education. Uh, and hopefully it will begin some more courageous conversations for you as well. I have called my short presentation, uh, Relationality, Negotiating, Navigating and Nurturing Spaces. Why have I done that? Because that's what we do. And I think that's what you also do as well. Every engagement, every interaction is an opportunity to negotiate how I am going to be in this space, how will I navigate this space, and how will I nurture the space? How will I nurture the others in this space? And how will I nurture um, any other spaces that come into play? So spaces are very interesting things in our lives all over Oceania, but certainly here also in Tonga. Um, because our lives are about spaces, um, where we live, how we operate in those spaces, how we operate uh, together with others in those spaces. Most of the work that the Institute does um, is, is uh, engaging with ministries of education right across the Pacific. Uh, and we work in many classrooms and in many schools, in many of the islands, not all of them, but in most of them. Each of these island contexts are different. So even though we may call ourselves uh, uh, people of the Pacific, uh, people of Oceania, uh, we have found in the work that we do that every island is still different. Uh, there are similarities, but there are a lot of differences as well. Even here, and even in the work that I mostly do here in Tonga, uh, children and schools on Tonga Tapu are slightly different from schools and classrooms in Hapai, in Fonoi, uh, and certainly in Vavao and in Ewa as well. So we have to learn to navigate these spaces. And that's what uh, we're very careful about at the Institute uh, is to, to first know ourselves first before we venture out to work with others. Um, this is a space that I think Nick was quite interested in. He asked me about um, Mototapu. And this, is, uh, this comes from, from writing by our director, Dr. Seula Johansson Four. Uh, where she identifies a space, um, and it is sometimes a, a literal space, it is an island, uh, where people come to rest before they enter into the harbour and they go to the islands that they want to go to. And so she named uh, this place, Mototapu, as a relational space that people like you and me can first meet and we negotiate the space that we are both going to inhabit to move forward into the work that we are about to do. So this is a, a, a sacred space, just like uh, the name Mototapu. Um, and it denotes um, that we must come to this Mototapu. We must meet at this place before we go into the work that we are about to do. You get to know us and we get to know you. And from there, we move forward into the work that we are about to do. So the mototapu is to be respected uh, and it is to be nurtured uh, so that everybody in that space 
in that motutaku feel space, uh, feel safe, so that they can share, share of themselves and share of their experiences. And so you come together and from there you will move on to the work that you want to do. Why have I used this picture? Why have I used this picture of an ancient Tongan Fali? Um, this is my first space. And I guess for a lot of uh, Tongans in the audience, this is probably your first space as well. The picture shows, I imagine, a Tongan family. Um, and I see myself as the child in this, not the baby, the other little child. When you're growing up, and if this is your filing, you can see everything. You can see the corner post. You can see the, the walls. You can see the rafters. And you can even see everything that is in the rafters. So for a Tongan child who is learning, they need to see everything. You can't hide. You can't really hide things from... So at the outset, you need to tell the children, this is what we have and this is what we want to do. So as a child um, uh, growing up, you know where you are supposed to be playing or you know where you are supposed to sleep and you know also where you are not supposed to go. And you know where you are to place things in the fale. And you also learn who has the voice that counts or the voice that carries. So for me, this is my first space. And this is the space that I had to learn to prepare me for all the other spaces that I will um, inhabit as I get older. For so long, we have had our spaces filled by many things. And sometimes these things make us uncomfortable, but we've had to do it because that's what you're told to do. And that's okay. But as we get older and as we pick up more experience, we become stronger at navigating and negotiating the spaces that we inhabit. Sometimes we're not very successful, that's okay. Because the idea about relationality is that it's fluid. You fall down, you get back up again. You get slapped down, you get back up again. And so for the work that we do in classrooms, we, I guess it's a kind of attitude that is uh, captured by a never say never attitude. It's that kind of attitude. If one thing doesn't work, we come back, come back to Amotutaku again, and then we go back in again. This did not work. Let's try it this way. So this is the first classroom for us. And this is where we identify the space that we are going to be in for a very long time. This is, I guess this is the space you keep coming back to even up until you die. But this is your first classroom. In this classroom, you learn about yourself. You see everything in your classroom. You see the aspirations of your family in this classroom. You identify the corner posts of your family in this classroom, you know who is sitting at the corner post, that person has the voice that carries, the voice that means something. But you know also there is a softer voice. Sometimes these softer voices are stronger as well. There are moments in the interaction where the softer voice also carries lots of weight. So that is my first space. And why am I, I showing you this? Because as uh, uh, Tongans, we 
we identify with this. We always go back to the home. We always attribute many things, most things, to what happens in the home. So my second slide, please. So knowing myself or knowing oneself is knowing my place. And so this is just an extension of my first slide. So this is where I place myself. Once I know my first classroom really well, I know my corner posts, I know what is hiding up in the rafters in full view of everybody else. I know how much color my family has. I know I see the how many rolls of mats and tapa up there. I already know. But then I still need to know my immediate family as well. And you will also um, confirm that it is important to know. You're the eldest out of how many children? You're the eldest grandchild. You're the eldest grandson. You're the only son. You're the only daughter. So you need to know that because from a young age, you are assigned roles and responsibilities because of your position in your family. And you quickly learn, what are my chores? What are the jobs that I need to do? Which you know gets increasingly more complicated as you get bigger. Yeah? You start out by feeding the chickens, then you move on to feeding the pigs, then you probably will build um, the fence for the pigs and for the chickens. And maybe one day, one day you will be the one responsible for preparing that pig for something that is happening in the family. So the chores begin from, uh, so the responsibilities begin from a very, very early age. And that's where we learn to negotiate our spaces. I think when you're small, I'm thinking about it, you know, when I was preparing this, I thought, I think as a child, I didn't really have any negotiating powers. You did as you were told. You inhabited the space you were given. When you were told, pick up all the leaves under those trees, you picked it up. No negotiation at all. So we learned that our space was just to listen quietly. Yeah, because there were repercussions if you didn't. But that is how we um, navigate spaces. If you can't negotiate, better to navigate quietly. Okay. When you have learned your space in your immediate family, you also have an extended family. And in that extended family, you probably have other positions and other roles and other responsibilities. And they are assigned to you as you get older. Sometimes you don't understand. You only understand it when you are much older. I'll show you a few slides after that demonstrate that. And then of course you have the bigger space that encompasses your school, your whole village, and your church. And church is a very powerful socializing agent here. And we know that we have to navigate spaces carefully there. I want to highlight that for me, and I'm only speaking for me, the way that I learned relationality was listening and watching quietly and doing as I was told. So children in the classroom, respond well to that kind of socializing activity by the teacher. Sit down, listen, do as you are told. Of course, there are a few exceptions, but most Tongan children will respond to that kind of instruction. Where did they learn that? They most probably learned it at home. So it does pay to look at that very first classroom, to understand that very first classroom. Some, some first classrooms are ideal. 
It's full of stories. It's full of songs. It's where your grandmother takes you to every function there is and you learn about people and you learn about things. And that's how you learn to cultivate your own space. Why am I talking about this first space? Because that's what we do here at IOE. We talk a lot about who we are, where we have come from, what kind of experiences we have had, so that we each know that individually we have strengths and collectively we are made stronger because of those individual strengths, right? We also identify what we are not good at, what we are uh, not confident in. We know who in the group never to ask to make a presentation in Tonga. They can't do it. We know who to ask, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to present a, a dance because they know how to do it. So knowing your team, knowing your team is essential so that when you go into that motutapu and you are negotiating space with people you're not really familiar with, you already know what your team can do, right? So we have that kind of engagement here where we, we know what people can do. So when we have a job um, that comes from Samoa, we say, okay, so-and-so can do this because they can work with whoever is at Samoa and can do that. And that should progress and advance that project. Yeah. So to just bring it back to Tonga, that's what schools should do, or that's what organizations in Tonga should do. They should know what are the individual strengths of every person on the team and what are their individual weaknesses so that when you are presenting yourself to, to complete a piece of work, you are presenting a united and strong front, right? And I think this is really valuable for schools as well. Their principals know their teachers, their teachers know their students, and so that when they are negotiating or when they are moving into an unfamiliar space, they know the strengths of each of the team, right? So this is the space that I ventured out. Um, my experience, probably different from everyone there in your group there. Sometimes my, my space from, for school, it went slightly different from all my cohorts in my, in my village, all the people in my age group. I went to an English speaking primary school. So very quickly, my space sort of looked different from my age group, right? There were others who went to boarding school for years and years and didn't come home. Their space expanded in different ways. So we have to recognize that even though we may have grown up in the same place and had the same experiences, our spaces, will have extended in multiple and in different ways. And so when we are engaging with people, uh, just because we are all Tongan doesn't mean we are all the same, right? So everybody is different. Can we have a look at the next um, slide, please, uh, Nick? So this is just further to um, talking about relationality and this is a familiar childhood memory for me. And I just chose it uh, because when I was thinking about this presentation, I thought, you know, how can I show them that um, this is where relationality can be negotiated and navigated and nurtured, 
But as a young child, my grandmother always took me to Kokaama. And I knew on a Friday night that I had to have the kikwekikane, little bucket, had all the ngafa ready. Uh, there was a scissors, there was glue, there was the um, foimanioke. So everything had to be put by the door the night before. My grandmother had a special dress for days like this, multiple pockets and everything. And she had a special flower. When she said, Alo I knew where to go and get it from. So I learned just by watching and by doing simple little errands like that. Then when you went to the place, I knew the songs, but not the stories because the stories were always whispered, right? And then they all cracked up laughing and I was not allowed to listen to those stories. It wasn't until I was much older that I was allowed to, to listen in to the stories. So they privilege the information and the stories to you. They gift it to you when they think you are ready to hear it. So I was never involved in doing all the preparation of the thing on the, on the, on the big board. But there came a time when I was allowed to draw, when they were drawing the ngatu, right? And uh, you had to sit at a certain place so that uh, you didn't spill the coca because something uh, would happen to you if you did. Because you spoil the, the ngatu for everybody. So I'm thinking that um, we learn about our spaces uh, from when we are gifted parts of space to us by our elders. Yeah. So for years, I wasn't allowed to go near the drawing of the ngatu until one year my grandmother said, yeah, you can do, uh, only do the side, only do the side, or only paint the numbers. Yeah. So I couldn't paint the middle until I was much older then I was allowed to paint the middle. And then the time for the presentation. I didn't join that until I was much older, until someone said, oh, she can carry that, she's big enough, right? So our spaces, uh, uh, sometimes we can't negotiate them. They're actually gifted to us. So as a child growing up in a big family, in a small village, um, that had multiple um, opportunities to learn, our spaces were sometimes gifted to us. We couldn't negotiate. Right? The next one, please. Once we learned, um, once we learned uh, how to operate in our immediate family, and in the extended family, and in the church, and in other places, that helps us to navigate our spaces in multiple contexts, yeah? So you begin to apply what you learned at home in that immediate space, and you use it to operate in the other spaces, right? So these are just pictures of my children, but, I use it to demonstrate that um, we teach them, we tell them um, quite clearly how to operate in some context. One minute, you could be wearing a clean ta'avala. Next week, if your auntie passes away, you can't wear that ta'avala. You'll be wearing another one, right? So when you're in the school, you bring some of the things that you learned from your first classroom. Be quiet, sit down, only the teacher is speaking. Listen carefully. So those are things that you learn. And those are the spaces that you bring to bear on this space that you have come to, the school. No wonder teachers have a hard time getting kids to speak up. 
to answer that question, to ask questions. Because why? Because at home, you can't do that, or you're not really encouraged to do that. You also bring some of those things from your first classroom. You bring it to your youth group. You learn um, about how to navigate that space. Where have you learned that? From home because of your multitude of cousins that you grew up with or from the school where you now have a huge growing group that you engage with every day. All the time we are learning also, how do we learn mafana? How do we pick up notions of the things that are important to us? We learn it at home. How do we learn to dance and carry on in celebrations? Because we've been watching it since we were little. This is from a, 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 an event at Utulao. They were um, bringing their money for Miss Nari, Enwo Miss Nari. So you have kids who are sitting around and they're watching their mothers wearing wedding gowns and all sorts of wigs and different colored wear. And they learn to navigate that space and they know, okay, maybe later on, I'm going to be doing something like that. I'm going to imitate. And that's one way that we learn as well. We watch, we listen, and we imitate. So we think about how do we engage in these contexts. If we are strong from our first classroom, if we have all the values that we need to know, uh, if we have been supported in the things that are important to us, they make us stronger to go into any of these contexts. And they make us gifted speakers. Uh, they make us confident students and confident teenagers. Um, and it also prepares us for study um, in much higher levels. On the next slide. And we are bound to the sea. That's what a Ebeliha offer says. We are children of the sea. We are of the sea. Sometimes our engagements and our attempts to cultivate space uh, feels like you're on a sea voyage. The sea is so deep, you can't see the bottom. The color keeps changing. The destination looks beautiful from afar. And then it's not until you get closer that you see other things that you didn't see from a distance. And that's how we are when we relate to people. And when we learn to work with people, we are as fathomless as the sea. We change color every day. We look different from afar. We look different close up. Um, sometimes we don't have the right tools to navigate on this ocean. Um, and so we get lost. Or we, um, or worse. So the sea is our home and we are bound to it. And so what it's telling us in the work that we do is that the possibilities are endless. The people that we engage with in space, we can never really know. Much as we want to, much as we try, we can't know people fully. Yeah. And that's what it's teaching us here. We are the sea. We are related to the sea. We are off the sea. But we don't know everything about the sea. So sometimes we get to a hard spot in the work that we do. And we use the ocean to explain why we are not engaging. 
we say, oh, because we were sailing in rough waters. Oh, because the, the, the tide changed on us or the tide, the, the waves uh, changed. Uh, or we didn't see clearly because it was a cloudy day. Or we were not feeling well because we were, we were sailing on a hot day. And in this picture on the right, we were chasing the, the sun, the sunset to half ever. And the sea looks so beautiful and so calm. And you could be, uh, and you come and you become complacent because the water looks so smooth. And you think, oh yeah, this space is so easy. Yeah. But it's not because we don't know everything all the time. The next slide. We are also of the sky and also of the land. And I think everybody understands this. The sky is as boundless as the sea. We learn just by looking at the sky, what kind of day it's going to be. But sometimes it's cloudy, but you get up on the plane and it's blue up there. So you didn't know that if you're standing down on the ground. The sun and the moon and the stars, they chart our paths. So sometimes we don't look at the sky often enough when we are trying to make our space work for us. Sometimes we can predict disasters, not only from the sky, but also what is happening on the ground. The children of Fonoi told me they can tell when there's going to be a cyclone just by looking at where the spiders spin their webs. I didn't know that. So the sky looks different on a sunny day. It looks different on a rainy day, just like the sea does. So in our uh, efforts to negotiate and navigate, we have to be very careful about what's up there and what's down there as well. We are linked to the land, even though Eberia offer argues that we are grounded in the ocean. Our placenta is called the fonua, and when our babies are born, this fonua or the land or the placenta is usually planted in a nice shady place, preferably under a, a tree uh, that bears uh, kakala flowers um, for making garlands. We bury the, the fonua or, or the placenta with the wish um, that this child will be grounded in this place uh, or in this land. Uh, in this api or under this tree. Sometimes when people put the tawala around them, you will hear people saying, you are tying, you are tying the land, or tying a fonua, ha e fonua, So we are forever attached to the land. It is our livelihood and we draw our livelihoods from it, our food, everything that sustains us can come from the land. We also know that the land has eyes and ears. We do not mess with land boundaries. Um, we guard the land fiercely and we return often to the place where our fonua was planted or was buried. And sometimes we feel a huge loss when this fonua is gone, or we don't know where it was buried, or we come back and it's inhabited by other people. So everything we do has to be grounded um, in the land. How do we ground it into the land? It is through our stories. It is through our practices. Um, it is through telling our children about the old stories, uh, about the songs, uh, 
It is about giving them something to carry on into the, into the future. How will our children remember us? They will remember us by the stories we tell them of the land and of the sea and of the sky and of the classrooms that we grew up in before we even went to GPS school. That is how we are going to uh, cultivate, or that is how we are going to make space for the future. So my second last slide. So I just wanted to come back to this space now because I went back to our conversation with Nick and he was talking about, uh, I'll talk about the aspects of relationality talk about possible indigenous tongue and pedagogy and maybe something to help Peace Corps. Um, and so I thought, all right, I'll just draw a table and I'll just throw everything onto it. Might help, might not, um, but it might help you. What are the aspects of relationality that I've been talking about? To know yourself, know your space, know that you can see everything all the time, anytime because it was already open to you when you were growing up. Know your immediate space. Who's my family? Where do I come from? How do I operate in that space? Use what you know to engage in other spaces. Something that was taught to you as a young child, you carry it through to today. At the same time, be open to new learning and be willing to learn. Allow other people into your space, just as you want to go into their spaces. Also allow them to come in. We also know that sometimes we disconnect from the spaces. We move ourselves out of the space because of our perceived invasion of space. We, we sometimes can feel uncomfortable because we don't know. So we retreat and we go silent and we disconnect. So what is a possible indigenous tongue and pedagogy? And these are just my thoughts. There's no research on it. This is just me trying to relate what I was talking about to what I have seen in the classroom um, that could be called a tongue and pedagogy. You observe carefully, you get kids to observe you or you yourself observe them. You listen actively, you learn quietly. Most importantly, tell them what the outcome should look like or, or what it can look like. Right? Not what it should look like, what it can look like, because it might end up looking like something else. Imitate before you innovate. You know, children, they will copy you. I, I've seen it in, almost every classroom I have worked in. But children like to engage actively. So teachers need to plan activities to keep children on task all the time. Some children also learn quietly. So that's something to, uh, for teachers to know, but not just for teachers, but for other people too. There are some children who will join in there are some people who will just watch quietly on the side. Always remember to go back to other similar activities. Always remind them, remember how we did this two weeks ago? Remember the stories. Remind the children of stories that you may have told them before that brings bearing on something that you're doing at that time. Return to your immediate space. Go back to your family your first classroom, just to check, did I get it right? Keep checking that you are on the right track and explore new things. You don't have to just stay in what's fully told. This is what we're going to do because this is what's important to us. You have to engage children so that they're able to explore so that they're able to make up their own mind about what it is 
they are wanting to take away and what it is they are wanting to discard. And of course, the most popular way of engaging is through Talanoa. So how could this help his score? This is your motto, because you are engaging with people all the time. And sometimes people you don't know and people you are not familiar with. So those are just um, my thoughts on how it might help you. I think I have an inkling that you are already doing a lot of these things. You get to know the people and you want to know what is important to them. Children on Fonoi have different needs from children in Lape, or maybe not, but we won't know until we try to find out what's important to them. Let them see everything. And so we want to set this up so that it can help you do this and this and this. Um, this is something, and, and this is just coming from knowing my first classroom. I need to know everything that's here and available to me. Also share of yourselves as well. Tell them who you are, where you have come from, and ask them questions so they can tell you about themselves. Ask them why they do what they do. Why are you doing that? Why are you taking this and putting it in a little container in the ocean? Ask them also why it's important for them, for them to do it. So you are getting to know the space well. And I imagine this is what you are already doing because this is what your, um, this is what the Peace Corps volunteers do in the villages. They really want to get to know the people. If there's something new you are introducing, always ask what they already know about it. Sometimes they already know a bit. And so you're going to add. So you're going to demonstrate. You're going to share that new way, that new innovation, that new way of doing things and let them watch. Let them try it out. Keep asking them if that's good. Keep watching them. Sometimes they won't tell you that they like it or not like it. They'll tell someone else. So watch them and watch the other ones around them as well. Learn to read silence correctly. Sometimes when we disconnect, we go silent. Silence is not consent, sometimes. So we need to know that also. Continue to Dalanoa. Continue to ask, continue to engage. And so to end my, my presentation today, I just have a short poem that I wrote. I wrote it, it's not a particularly good one, um, but I wrote it because I was talking about space and trying to relate to the space. And I called it my space. My space can be yours too for a price. If I let you come into my space, you have to learn to appreciate, to share, and I will share. Learn and appreciate your space too, so that we don't crash, bump, run into each other, and keep invading each other's space because we didn't know. Malo Abita. Thank you.